Okay, so uh, welcome uh, back uh, everyone uh, to our second uh, talk of this morning session. Um, this talk will be given by uh, Dr. Vittoria Covella. Um, Dr. Covella works as an open data facilitator for Think Open, which is the Open Science Initiative at the Center for Mind and Brain Sciences at the University of Trento. Uh, he's involved in disseminating open science concepts and best practices. He particularly supports researchers who are interested in adopting open access publishing and open data sharing. And the title of his talk today is Increasing the Impact of Your Research by Using Rich, Integrated, and Open Access Communications. And so with this, I leave the floor to Dr. Ecobella. Okay, so increasing the impact of your research by using rich, integrated, and open access communications. Lots of keywords in this title. I uh, hope I will be able to cover everything and at least uh, uh, try to elicit uh, discussion after the talk. I would start by trying to describe what I think uh, should be the shape of research products to come in the next 10 years. This is a vast program, I would say, but I would try uh, at least to mention a few initiatives that I uh, think are worth uh, uh, discussion, discussing. Uh, I would then switch to something we are facing now, um, that is the flavors of impact or article level metrics or alt metrics. And then finally, as far as my favorite element are tutorials, I will uh, quickly close my talk with a how to uh, use Twitter for uh, scientific research. So I'll start with uh, mentioning the preface to Berlin Declaration 2003. For those of you uh, working with open access, maybe you're familiar with these clauses. Uh, these are actually the um, philosophical preface uh, to the open access uh, declarations and requirements. Uh, the very first clause uh, reads that sources of knowledge uh, should be basically readily and widely available to society. And the final one kind of characterized, which is uh, uh, the knowledge, including scient original scientific research and so on. And then there is this central part, which says that the internet should be seen as a functional medium to distribute knowledge. This is the philosophical basis of the open access movement, but I think uh, that the internet as a functional medium part is sometimes underrated. Uh, as a researcher or people working in research, um, we kind of like take this uh, internet as a functional medium part as for granted. Internet is there for us, for our research. We spend most of our time like typing keywords and so on and so forth. Uh, the interesting part of the story, I think, and what uh, I would want you to focus on is the fact that uh, 2003 internet, when the Berlin Declaration came out, it's a completely different place with respect to, for example, 2010 internet and 2020 internet. For those of you, for example, born in the 80s, you can remember maybe Alta Vista, uh, P2P like Napster and so on. Uh, people born, uh, for example, in the 90s uh, would remember MySpace days and so on. And if in the audience there are people uh, born in like early 2000s, maybe uh, the very first memories of the internet is, for example, Snapchat or TikTok and so on. So internet changes and it's a completely different place with completely different capabilities. And this holds also for scientific research. Uh, internet, it's not uh, like a server of papers, any, just a server of papers anymore. Uh, Internet capabilities in 2020 include many sources of well-described open data, for example, Open Neuro, uh, which um, I guess all the audience is familiar with. And then I'm not going into details uh, about this because uh, Serena gave us a very interesting presentation related to this. We have online notebooks where we could uh, uh, type our code and also write down collaboratively uh, pieces of code, for example, with uh, uh, Kokauf, which is a, a sort of like a tool built on uh, Jupyter. And all these uh, uh, capabilities 
also unleash this kind of like uh, interactive gamified way to approach scientific question, to, uh, scientific concept or question. For example, uh, all those initiatives which goes under the, uh, this kind of label, which is called explorable explanation. This is actually a website you can explore uh, yourself. So after this introduction, what I want uh, to, uh, let's say, grab is that uh, research products and the way in which they are published, they still remain a sort of plain digital translation of what they use on paper. So 20 years ago or 200 years ago, scientists used to sit on their desk and write down stuff and then somehow obtain a camera ready version. I think uh, many people uh, they, are read, they are still dealing in 12, 2020 with this sort of like screenshot of what you wrote. And this is not only an index uh, of lack of creativity in this field, but it also limits potential new scientific questions arising from going beyond the paper. Uh, I like this expression because I, uh, I'm seeing that it's a recurring concept uh, throughout this um, conference. I think Camille Momet yesterday used exactly the same uh, expression and today uh, Serena I think uh, the, the entire uh, talk by Serena was uh, uh, related to this. So I just mentioned a couple of initiatives. Uh, one is called Neurolibre which is a curated repository of interactive neuroscience notebooks that seamlessly integrate data, text, code and figures. Uh, I'm going to show you an example which I think it's really interesting. So this is like um, an initiative uh, uh, made by the Canadian guys, which uh, no offense, but they're really among the best in the biz. Uh, here is sort of like an explanation of uh, uh, signal modeling uh, in uh, magnetic resonance. But the interesting part of this story is that you can read the explanation and then start playing around with what happens with uh, several parameters, for example, the T1 uh, parameter. Another interesting initiative is called Distill, because I've already, uh, I could already imagine questions like, yeah, this Neurolibre doesn't have DOI, it's not peer review, it's just like a place where you take notes and so on. It's true. Uh, I think it's a promising, a promising tool, but still we have uh, an example of a journal. So this Distill journal, uh, it's an academic journal in the area of machine learning, which is dedicated to human understanding, which I think uh, it's an, uh, a fantastic example of what uh, um, a journal uh, mission should be. Uh, and these still articles often, but not always use interactive media. This journal, it carries a DOI. Where's my pointer? Okay. It carries a DOI and it also has peer reviews. Of course, it is like uh, just a machine learning uh, related uh, uh, journal. So you may think that uh, there is a very specific bubble using uh, uh, this initiative, but I think, uh, and I will try to show you an example as well. Uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, um, way of uh, uh, making scientific publications uh, as developed, as uh, modern as the internet capabilities offer. For example, I will let you maybe later on play with these experiments in the writing with a neural network. And if you click here, there is actually an experiment which is happening under your nose. So if I type here my handwriting, there is actually a neural network learning from my handwriting and trying to reproduce, try to infer what uh, is the way in which I write. And this is a scientific paper. It has a DOI, you can cite it, but it allows you to play around scientific concepts. And this is uh, from both an educational and scientific point of view, I think uh, something which is really interesting. And sorry for this exchange, but if you want to uh, go for examples, this is uh, uh, necessary. So, as a summary of this very first part of my talk, 
Internet is a functional medium of the research since several decades, but its evolution was not followed by the evolution of all research products. There are interesting examples of taking advantage of current internet capabilities. And I have to say that in my title, I wrote down next because I want to appear like uh, uh, the guy predicting the future, but it's not next. It's already here. So it's up to researcher to adopt uh, this kind of techniques and uh, try to um, bring the scientific, uh, uh, the scientific research products to another era beyond the paper. After this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, landscape of examples related to what uh, uh, the paper might be in the next years, um, I would try to introduce you something that uh, is happening now uh, and specifically since a bit like uh, 10 years. So something like uh, a way to quantify the impact of someone's research uh, considering all the flavors uh, which are uh, sometimes not considered by the plain uh, uh, classic uh, bibliometric index like uh, for example um, H index let alone journal impact factor. So the very first uh, thing you should consider is uh, uh, sort of a question why should I take a look at certain research product? Uh, no one can, could read everything um, I think yesterday morning, uh, Massimo Grassi uh, repeated uh, all uh, over his uh, contribution that uh, there are more and more uh, papers published uh, all over the years and uh, like a classic way uh, you use, he used to uh, do for filtering or um, uh, let's say uh, reading the latest news uh, that was like going through the table of contents of journal is not possible anymore. Uh, what is actually uh, happening is that researchers, they rely on activity-based filters to select, browse, potentially read and potentially build on what uh, they, they read, um, what they consider relevant for their purposes. And this is just uh, a way to enumerate uh, the activities you can uh, do uh, on a research product and this very first part of the screen so uh, the keyword search interaction with other researchers it's something that you do for filtering for example um, a colleague of yours uh, came to you and say you should check this paper because it's interesting and so on and so forth uh, and you should trust uh, that colleague of you, if you are interested in what he's saying um, what they are saying, um, it's very likely that you're going to read that contribution, you save it in your collection, and you browse around, and then maybe you study in the paper. These kind of interactions, which lead to a filtering of research products, were always there. Scientists, since like forever, they talked about uh, uh, scientific publications, uh, there is not even need of uh, like the internet as a functional medium as we were discussing the very first part of the talk. Maybe a coffee maker would help because people gather around and start uh, doing scientific small talk and so on. What it's interesting now is that uh, these kind of interactions, they could happen online on a digital form through, for example, mentioning on Twitter, on news, on blogs, on Wikipedia, and so on. And this kind of interaction is actually quantifiable. We can keep track of everything related to this kind of uh, uh, mentioning. All this kind of interaction, they form a trace of impact because all of these stages, they are kind of impacting so a research product which goes through all these stages impacts on your uh, research production in every way. Even if you're not going to consider that paper anymore because, uh, uh, for example, you didn't like it, somehow uh, this is going to condition you uh, in the next future. The bad news, I would say, or let's say the news here, I don't want to, to characterize this badly because uh, this is what draws science for like the, the last uh, centuries uh, is that uh, the only way 
or one of the uh, ways uh, we have to uh, we had to uh, characterize this impact was just through the citation. So, if a, if a research product uh, made an impact, like uh, before uh, mentioning and so on, we could just control it whether it has like a high number of citations. And this was an index of the impact of that research. What is happening now is that we have ways to trace that impact. Um, this way, it's uh, commonly referred to as uh, alt metrics, article level metrics, alternative metrics. Um, it's basically the same. I would uh, uh, say more on this uh, uh, later on. Uh, the actual point here, here is that uh, several different online activities, they form a composite trace of impact, which is different than the one depicted by citations. Uh, for example, uh, if you have an interesting uh, um, online tutorial which is published on Zenodo, uh, which gives you actually a digital object identifier, so that research product is fair in the sense of fair principle, uh, that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to, to uh, cite in a paper a tutorial. But that paper, for example, um, explaining you how to pre-process the fMRI data in, in a certain way, or just to install uh, AFNI or SPM on your machine, had an impact, as a crucial impact on your research. So, uh, citing that, uh, mentioning that online, citing the DOI, is going to trace uh, the way in which uh, uh, that kind of uh, research product impacted your research. And the purpose of Altmetrics is keeping track of all the elements of this trace of impact as soon as possible. Because uh, once a preprint or a paper came out, uh, you can start going on Twitter and saying, I, I just read this paper which came out yesterday, I think this, this, and this, and that's already um, something which is going to increase the Altmetric of that paper as soon as possible. On the other hand, like old papers or old way uh, to assess the impact of uh, a research, uh, you should wait maybe years uh, to trace the impact of uh, a research uh, because, uh, uh, for example, um, you have to build other research on that specific uh, uh, activities and this would require months, let alone years. Or maybe everyone is reading an interesting paper, but it's difficult to, um, which for example, change uh, the entire view of a specific field, but it's difficult to build on um, what they say. So maybe citations are not representing the impact of uh, uh, that work on the scientific community. And here, uh, um, there are a few examples of uh, uh, what is going to increase the alt metrics related to a paper, web activity, PDF downloads, Mendeley saves, social media activity, Facebook, it's uh, nowadays a social network for, uh, let's say, elderly people, so and it's not used really anymore, but still, Twitter mentions, we're going to dedicate the entire last part of this talk related to this, and also, uh, and I think uh, nowadays that we are facing, uh, we're still facing the pandemic, uh, new ma news mentions, it's something that uh, maybe won't be really that interesting for the scientific part of uh, uh, the impact story of our research, but if a paper was mentioned in all the news, somehow we should recognize that that paper had an impact. And the same goes for Wikipedia mentions. Here I show this uh, uh, interesting uh, correlation plot. It's from an old uh, paper by uh, Jason Prim, P.O.R. and Hemminger. They are uh, part of the uh, group animating the alt matrix. Uh, so here we have just uh, a correlation between uh, bibliometric indices and you can see that I think uh, this was made uh, on uh, uh, over 20,000 paper published on a PLOS um, uh, um, within the PLOS uh, uh, big um, 
let's say, envir journal environments, let's say, all the, all the journals related to PLOS. And the interesting part of this story is that there is a cluster related to, uh, let's say, classic um, ways to um, quantify the impact of a research. And somehow, the way in which you uh, arrive to citing a paper, for example, downloading it, uh, seeing uh, in, a, in HTML and saving the paper in Mendeley. And here it's like a site you like save. This is something that belongs to the way in which you used to browse the web like 10 years ago. Social bookmarking is not like a thing anymore. RSS feeds are not like the next big thing as we used to think like 10 years ago, but still, this is a paper from 2012. What I want to uh, focus here is that on here is that uh, social media ac activity it's something that for example the Twitter mentions they're poorly correlated with the classic uh, metric indices but still they actually uh, to some extent um, indicate that someone download that paper someone view that web page so there was an impact of that paper this paper circulated among scientists, even if maybe uh, they report poor uh, citation uh, amount of citations. So the, the flavor of this impact is uh, um, is actually shown just by the Almetric uh, measure. And to explore all this uh, universe of Altmetrics, there are many tools. Uh, I particularly like this dimension.ai uh, tool. It's a data browsing tool. You can go there, type down uh, like paper title. You can follow the evolution of the Altmetrics throughout the years. You can, um, let's say, compare them to citations. You can uh, see all the Twitter mentions that paper had and so on and so forth. Uh, there are other uh, kind of uh, uh, Altmetrics tools, um, which I think they are actually um, under a subscription, but uh, uh, if, you are, if your institution has, for example, um, a dedicated archive, uh, University of Trento has its own uh, dedicated internal archive, it's very likely that this archive uh, have, they have actually a subscription of these Altmetrics uh, uh, indicators. So you can browse also, you can take advantage of your institution uh, capabilities and browse around uh, this kind of uh, stories. Altmetrics, they were like pro provocatively defined a good idea with a bad name because, and this is uh, something that I want uh, uh, to, to stress, they are not an alternative to classic metrics in that I cannot choose to, uh, for, for like uh, um, fine tuning the impact of a research product, I cannot rely just on enough metrics. The metrics are something that represent what's happening on the web, which is not taken in account uh, by uh, classic metrics. Uh, also, as I was trying to uh, to mention throughout uh, the whole talk, what looks alternative today might require another alternative in the future. Uh, so uh, just imagine the web 10 years ago, uh, Google Reader was the thing, everyone was following like all the uh, scientific publication journals with the feed RSS, and now it's not a thing anymore. I bet people born like in the year 2000, they don't even know what that orange button on the website uh, uh, means anymore. So uh, this is always something which is uh, uh, slowly evolving. And something else I want to uh, mention about this part of the talk uh, is the fact that Altmetrics, uh, they are a new concept, of course, but they also represent something which was already present uh, in the scientific community, community, for example, informal talk, uh, coffee maker talks, and so on. But also, they're going to take into account new exchanges, for example, code reuse, if your code had a DOI, tutorial uh, citation, if your tutorial, for example, you put it on Zenodo, as, uh, for example, Serena was mentioning before, 
uh, you can keep track of uh, the impact of the tutorials, which are um, not, not because I like tutorials and I used to uh, give tutorials, but tutorials are going to uh, have an impact of, for example, on students or early career research um, um, knowledge in a crucial way. Sometimes, uh, not more, uh, let's say, not in a uh, bigger way with respect to papers, but for example, in a, uh, let's say, a mandatory way. Before you start, uh, for example, uh, doing uh, uh, whatever uh, data analysis on your data, you need to learn tools and a tutorial is there for you to teach you how to use a tool. And my point is that there should be uh, somehow recognize the role of these tutorials as uh, they are going to drive the advancement or the development in scientific uh, knowledge. Also, uh, this part of the story is that uh, Altmetrics, they return an immediate measures of the response to research products. Um, that is because uh, uh, a paper came out today and people there start uh, uh, mentioning uh, the paper uh, immediately, even starting from the preprint. That's, uh, that, for example, uh, was what happened with uh, the uh, NARPS uh, uh, initiative. Uh, yesterday we had this interesting talk by Roten Botvinik Neza, and I think uh, uh, such a great paper. Uh, it's already become an instant classic because uh, I just checked the um, the alt metrics for that paper, and as far as I remember, there are like uh, thirteen hundred uh, threads on Twitter mentioning that paper. So this is uh, uh, something. And I don't know. I think uh, there are uh, less than one or two papers already citing that paper. Uh, so that's um, an immediate demonstration on how. Uh, Altmetrics are going to give you an immediate uh, response of what uh, uh, was the impact of a research product. Finally, uh, seven years ago, National Science Foundation, uh, they came out uh, uh, with uh, a specific policy, which I think was adopted uh, also in the Netherlands uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where they switched from like the uh, from uh, mentioning scientific publications or papers uh, towards research products. Uh, that's, I think, a way to, um, to elicit people uh, publishing all the stuff they consider relevant for the rest of the community, uh, even if it's not a paper, for example, code, data, and also tutorials. Um, I would say that this is just maybe a, a divertissement, but uh, um, I was talking about this uh, uh, a few months ago uh, with a colleague of mine, Giorgio, I don't know, maybe he's uh, in the audience. Research products, I think it's uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, expression, but uh, uh, I think uh, one should be careful in uh, introducing this kind of like uh, uh, company or startup like uh, language into scientific community. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, considering the research, uh, like a research outcome or a, a research product, a product uh, maybe could lead to misunderstanding and uh, let's say a uh, very bad way to characterize uh, um, science, which is different from like uh, um, tech industry and so on. So maybe it's worth discussing whether this expression is the best one in this uh, context. And that's, uh, that was it for the second part of my talk. So uh, we went through uh, the shape of publication to come in the next year, in, in the next few years. We introduced a way uh, to value uh, current publication, but also next generation of publications. And then for the last part of my talk, I'm going to introduce you, to, to give you a quick how-to uh, on using Twitter for research, which is, which is exa exactly uh, the way in which you want to proceed, uh, or what I propose is a way to proceed to increase uh, this kind of uh, um, article level metrics online.
So just to begin with, uh, uh, I think that many people would think about uh, Twitter as a source of procrastination, true, uh, and also a place where, let's say, nothing really interesting is happening, just small talk, memes, uh, like gossip, television personalities, and so on. It's true. Uh, but it's also a place where you can uh, meet other people from your uh, academic bubble or from other bubbles. Um, and uh, let's say it's a, it might be considered as a professional tool as many other tools. So uh, if you are going to approach Twitter as a sort of like uh, non-interesting uh, tool and something that uh, uh, would uh, give you something like a response with no effort, then this is not, uh, I would say, uh, the right uh, uh, way of approaching this tool. If you want to use effectively uh, Twitter for your everyday job, then you have to put some effort uh, in, the, in it. It's actually, uh, I mean, a professional effort in uh, condensing the information into tweets. And the rule number one or rule zero, or whatever you can, whatever you want uh, uh, to be your very first number, if you're from Python or MATLAB, uh, the very first rule is don't be annoying. Uh, the relevant part of the story is here in the blue area. You have to post something which does something positive for your reader, something which serves uh, your readers. No one cares about uh, stuff that serves yourself. If you're going to post something on Twitter related to your job, then always think about what you're posting and what will be the outcome for people reading that tweet. It should be uh, something which uh, returns uh, something relevant for their uh, everyday job as, um, for example, you think uh, uh, reading other tweets uh, you got something for uh, your everyday job, reading tweets for, from the other people. And to make sure that this is going to happen, what I would suggest is to fine tune the content of your tweet. Uh, here we can consider uh, two axes. The very first one is like the, the content axis, which goes from entertainment to actual content. And I'd say that all this square we are going to, or, or like this, uh, this square uh, dividing the Twitter universe, all the parts, they are pretty fine. Uh, it's not like uh, that on Twitter you have to focus on content and just be that one always talking about uh, uh, papers and so on. You can also uh, have a, an entertaining experience on Twitter. Just uh, be careful, um, also referring to the previous slide about what you're going to post and how many times per day. You don't want to be the guy posting always entertainment con content. Uh, other people would uh, uh, just, uh, for example, label you as the account that posts just jokes, so nothing really relevant uh, to see here, just skip. The other axis is the target of the tweet. You can do a mainstream tweet, which is perfectly fine, or you can uh, build a tweet which is going to be relevant or understood just for a small portion of your bubble. For example, uh, you discovered that uh, to um, fine tune an AFNI parameter, you can do such and such, and within all your followers, maybe just 5% of those people uh, could understand what you're talking about. But for those people, maybe uh, that Twitter is the most relevant information they would read uh, that day. So you can you kind of like have an impact on uh, uh, the research routine on that day. And this kind of uh, division of axis is going to divide the Twitter universe in four areas. One I used to call it the serious red area. This is something that you really don't want to, for, for a professional Twitter account, you don't really want to sit in this area. Then a pink area and green and light green areas, they are like mostly fine areas. Let's try to fill this square. Here in Sirius Red Area, we have, uh, I hope that 
here you can you have not a black box i don't know uh because this is something okay i think uh worse come the worst uh, now it uh, disappeared so in serious red areas you have jokes generic memes no one really cares sorry about this uh, you can uh have another twitter account which is not uh, related to your profession and post there all the jokes and memes that you want it's perfect, perfectly fine but if you want to use twitter as a professional tool then it won't stick to that thread areas and then there is the pink area which is uh, like inside jokes uh, like the one about python matlab it's okay uh, lab like tweets uh, one of your colleagues uh, uh, your colleagues they made a cake and you have a nice uh, lab picture it's fine to, i think it's nice to to, to see uh, people having a good time in their lab social events i'm uh, like at hbm in rome i'm eating some carbonara and then i want to post it like the, a picture of my lab uh, eating together and it's uh, i think uh, perfectly fine just uh, do not stick to this kind of like uh, pink area uh, as the main part of your Twitter uh, um, stream, because uh, people are there to read content. Um, what I want to focus on here is this uh, like top right part of the story, which is research product announcement, which is going, this I'm going to mention uh, here, but I'm going to repeat it throughout the rest of the talk. You have to mention the digital object identifier. So, when your paper comes out, uh, you want to build a, th a Twitter thread, uh, for example, made uh, of two or three uh, tweets. I just remind you that you have uh, 280 characters uh, to explain what you want to say. And when you want to announce uh, a product, for example, a paper uh, that just came out, you should include the product DOI, and this is going to increase the alt metrics of that product. You want to put representative figures because, uh, let's say, that figure is going to, to drive uh, the most immediate content to the people. And you want to mention product's main message. If your paper is going to show whatever uh, neural correlates of whatever uh, task, then you may want to include this in, for example, your very first tweet. And then finally, you want to enumerate uh, all the tweets you're going to, uh, to post to convey in relevant messages uh, with uh, this kind of like convention, like one slash n. I would say if you, and that's my suggestion, if you have prepared your tweets um, by yourself before posting, you already know how many tweets you're going to post. And it's, I think, good practice to post, for example, if you're going to post six tweets, uh, to, to put six here, because if you're going to tweet 24 tweets, no one is going to read it. And here prepared a, an interesting example by someone um, from uh, Iranian Institution of Technology, IIT. Uh, here, he was mentioning a new preprint. Uh, it just came out. Uh, this is just, um, um, a tool which shortens the links, but this is going to refer to the DOI of that paper. Figures, scientific questions, other figures, other figures, and closing remarks. That's, I think, uh, like research product announcement 101. It's a very nice way uh, to introduce um, a research product. Uh, on Twitter. This is going to increase the alt metrics. People are going to retweet uh, this tweet, including the DOI. So this would result as a Twitter thread. And if your bubble is well uh, built, uh, many people are going to discuss this. So this kind of announcement is going to have an impact on their uh, research routine for that day. There are many tools uh, built on Twitter itself. Uh, for example, I'm just going to, uh, to mention all these things um, very quickly. Uh, for example, the fact that you can organize the account you follow with lists, and lists are public, so you can follow lists curated by others. Here you have an example of a famous Twitter account, it's called Narrow Conscience. Click here, 
view list and uh, Mika Hallen, uh, he did a very like an outstanding job in uh, like collecting uh, Cogneuro people uh, throughout all uh, the Twitters. So you can follow the list if you're interested in Bayesian brains, for example, you click here, you have list members and tweets and you can follow this uh, kind of discussion. Uh, it could be relevant for your research. And then there is another tool, I'm not going to switch back to the presentation because I just want to introduce this other tool, which is called TweetDeck. With TweetDeck, you can organize lists and stuff in columns. For example, I have my own, this is like the cognitive neuroscience list um, curated by neuroconscience. And I'm going to put it in this column and I could follow the update of that list in a very easy way. And also, here on TweetDeck, uh, I don't think you're going to see this because well, I can bring it here. I can look for an hashtag and put it in a column. For example, I'm at a conference. I'm interested in what people are saying about the conference. I create a column related to the conference uh, hashtag. And then the final tool I'm going to introduce today is called Nuzzle. This is a very underrated tool. Uh, this is something that is going to report you whether people you follow are all, like more than one people that you follow are talking about specific things. For example, here I see that, actually it's interesting because like uh, think over over the workshop people like Serena or Cameron, they're tweeting about Zenodo removing Alphmetric badges. And I'm interested in Alphmetrics. I think it's, uh, this is something that could interest me. So I'm going to click this and read what they have to say. And this is something that resembles a sort of like, uh, for example, all the FMRI people in your department, they are talking about one paper. Uh, you talk uh, to them uh, in front of a coffee maker and one guy says, you should check that paper. Another guy says, you should check that paper. So many people, they are suggesting you that paper. It's likely that that paper is worth reading. And this is something like an online translation or digital translation of this kind of interaction. Back to the presentation, I think I have just a few slides more. Uh, Twitter trans transfers online, common interactions and facilitate new and innovative exchanges. It's becoming one of the de facto standards to improve the impact of your research through alt metrics. It could be combined with other tools unleashing social network powers and capabilities like uh, TweetDeck or Nuzzle. And I think an interesting part of this story is that uh, since a few years, they're actually Twitter conferences. Uh, uh, this year, this conference was called OH OHBM Equinox. It took place on uh, March uh, 20. It was like a 24 hour online conference based on uh, the, let's say, uh, six tweet uh, convention I illustrated you before. And I think uh, uh, if you remember uh, where we were on March 20, at least in Italy, stuck within the lockdown, having uh, uh, like this extraordinary scientific content uh, being posted there uh, for everyone uh, in a sort of like uh, translation of open access into the Twitter uh, environment. This was really an outstanding experience. And this was built on other experience, uh, which uh, another experience which uh, was called Brain TC uh, in the previous years. So I think uh, uh, it was really. Uh, perfect timing for HBM uh, to, uh, let's say, adopt this kind of uh, uh, convention for this year. Just to close this talk, uh, internet capabilities are changing and are driving new ways of disseminating knowledge going beyond the paper. Um, if you want to trace in a responsive way the impact of fair research products, which uh, in my humble opinion, they should be open access because uh, you're browsing Twitter through your phone, uh, in your house, and maybe you are not uh, connected to your department uh, uh, network, so you don't have subscription to the journal. If the paper is not open access, it's very uh, bad to read a, a Twitter thread mentioning a paper. You click there, you tap there, and you cannot reach the actual content. This is not really fair, uh, pun intended. 
because Twitter is a way to connect uh, to other scientists all over the world and dis discuss in an immediate and effective way all aspects related to scientific development. And I also used to close all my talks, not only with take-home messages, but with take-home practices. And these are a few questions for you. Uh, you may think about whether an interactive figure could reveal something more about your latest results. For example, if you put uh, um, an activation map online with a slide uh, to change the threshold and explore uh, all the brain uh, by the reader itself, is this going to reveal something more about your research? You can check on your, your publicational alt metrics or for students, for example, your PI publication alt metrics, and you can start thinking whether they differ from citation patterns and how, for example, if the initial stages or the initial, the early life of paper, they have more alt metrics, uh, if alt metrics they're going to decay, if citations are going to grow, and so on. And start thinking whether the impact of a research is sort of a sustained process of is something which is uh, dynamically changing. And then you may consider three scientists in your field. They have a Twitter account. What do they tweet? It's interesting to follow them, and so on and so forth. And with this, I finish my talk, and thanks for your attention. Uh, okay, we have, um, we have a question um, from uh, the audience, um, from Ximena uh, Tiskirano Osorno. Uh, and the question is the following. Do you know if there are other social medias that we can use for research purposes besides Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Nazar. I'm not very familiar with Instagram, but do you know if it's possible to use that social media? There are many tools there online uh, for every purpose, let's say instant messaging, um, data sharing, and stuff like this. And maybe the best tool uh, thinking about, for example, uh, instant messaging like uh, this, this um, like Telegram, WhatsApp, or Signal, and so on. Uh, sometimes, like the best tool is not the most widely used. Uh, so even if it, uh, for example, it would be better to use a tool with respect to another, then there is no uh, specific audience to target the content uh, of your. Uh, of your posts uh, in um, other social medias. So I think that uh, in the current situation, Twitter is one of the best places to, to share research related posts. Uh, I would say that uh, this is something that uh, is going to happen, which is happening now. Uh, I think that 10 years ago, uh, like scientific blogging was on fire. Everyone had his own blog where they posted uh, their impressions, uh, thoughts about uh, papers, open peer reviews and so on. But then we have seen like in the last decade, uh, these uh, uh, blogging tools, uh, they are fading away in favor of Twitter's, uh, Twitter threads. Uh, so it might be the case that in five years, Twitter is not there anymore uh, for academic, uh, uh, for placing academic products uh, online. Uh, I would say that Instagram has at least uh, one big problem. That is uh, that it's hard to post links there. So even if uh, on one hand, I think it's, it would be nice to convey like uh, messages in form of like square pictures and you swipe around one, two, three pictures related to your paper. That would be nice, I think. But then if you want to place the, di the digital object uh, identifier, then I think it could be a bit uh, difficult to do, the, to do so. And same for Instagram stories, which I think would, uh, would be an interesting uh, tool to develop, especially for example, for presentations. Uh, you have uh, your, your Instagram story uh, where the flow of your presentation is defined by you and so on, but still placing the DOI would be a bit, uh, uh, a bit difficult. Uh, about other social medias, uh, on top of my head, 
for now i cannot think about uh, uh, something different uh, but still uh, i'm pretty sure that in the next 10 years we'll see something coming out or let's say tools uh, used uh, today as well which uh, somehow will become the de facto standard that twitter is uh, is being today i don't know if this uh, um, if this uh, answer to your question um, we'll, we will monitor the, the chat to see if there's mm -hmm. a follow-up. Uh, now we have uh, two questions. The first from uh, Carlo Minucci. Okay, yes, thank you, Vittorio. And also, thank you for reminding me that I come from the era of dinosaur because uh, I remember the, the, the noise produced by the modem when I was uh, trying to connect to the network. Uh, it was a nice... Uh, memory. <laughs> so your, your presentation tells me that uh, a researcher um, like us cannot any longer just worry about uh, the research. And so we cannot just focus on what we are doing as a researcher, but we have also to take care of a lot of uh, communication and in how I spread my research. So do you think that this kind of approach is something that uh, the individual single researcher can carry on by uh, by him or herself or do you think that there should be uh, an institution a structure uh, try to help the researcher to do these kind of things yeah uh, i think there are uh, so it's um it's an interesting question because uh, i think uh, there are many, uh, let's say, levels of assessing someone's work online. Um, I would say that for an institution, it's mandatory nowadays uh, to have a proper uh, presence online. And for example, our institution, UnityN, it has uh, uh, its own Twitter account, an Instagram account, Facebook account and so on, but uh, it's not bad. Um, I want uh, I don't want to put uh, colors on this uh, uh, on this expression. I would just say that uh, this kind of institutional uh, accounts, uh, even like a, a single department account, uh, they may serve. If you remember that that kind of plot, uh, if if you remember that kind of plot. Uh, um, target of the, of the content posted by an institutional account would serve, let's say, the mainstream, for example, the university events, department events, new papers coming out with just announcements. Uh, I have to say that uh, the scientific content of an actual paper, so uh, something which could generate a discussion, uh, it might be not so easy to delegate uh, uh, scientific discussions to an institutional account because, for example, you were the one writing down, uh, you, generic you, were the one uh, writing down the paper itself and if someone is going to ask you on Twitter uh, how did you select, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the ROIs for that analysis, then it's very hard that a person uh, dedicated just or just to assessing online presence of an institution is going to answer to that question. So, uh, as I always used to say when I, I'm engaging in these uh, discussions, it's very hard uh, to create, uh, like, uh, or it's very hard to, to deal with this very specific roles dedicated to specific tasks. Uh, my view of, of open science is that uh, this, this kind of uh, fluidity between roles and uh, blending of uh, research stages. So, yes, I think that uh, it could be useful. It's not mandatory, but it could be useful for a research uh, to curate his own uh, Twitter account and maybe coordinate with institutional accounts or department accounts, uh, for example, um, with the visual identity, uh, coherence of the tweets and so on, in order to assess the presence online of both the institution and uh, the researcher as well. That, that would be my, my take. So 
I think this should not be like the main activity uh, for a researcher at all. I mean, you, the main activity should be to do research, but uh, I think this is something really helpful uh, to communicate your research. So, for example, condensing concept uh, from a paper in 280 characters, I think it's a very interesting uh, and useful effort for every researcher out there. So your point is that we are not advertising our research, we are just communicating uh, important results, isn't it? I think it's a mix of the two things. Uh, adver scientific advertising, I think, uh, it must include scientific content. So, uh, like, reasonable, science curated scientific content. So, I think, again, there is no way to disentangle all the roles in this uh, story. But that's my opinion. Maybe uh, other institutions have, like, uh, uh, specific people uh, tweeting around scientific contents and then uh, they are able to advertise other people's work and respond to the, uh, to the conversation in uh, an effective way. So maybe just a matter of uh, like training people to do so. And maybe just uh, making people uh, working in social media for an institution to live, for example, lab life and get acquainted with lab practices and so on. And maybe after a few months, they would be able to answer the questions uh, and uh, uh, participate to arguments and to, to discussion on Twitter and so on on Twitter and so on. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think about uh, ResearchGate? In your opinion, is it a reliable tool for open research? I really like this question. <laughs> Where to begin? Okay. Uh, let's say nice things first. Uh, ResearchGate is an interesting tool. It saves researcher lots of time because uh, I think it generates on the fly profiles without even asking to do it. If you have your papers uh, uh, around, for example, on your uh, on the Google Scholar profiles, I think it automatically grab information, create a fake, it's not a fake profile, but like a, an impersonal profile that you may or may not uh, curate. Um, and I think maybe this is ResearchGate or uh, this is uh, academia.edu, uh, but I think the tools are pretty much uh, similar. So I think it's, um, it might be a useful tool. I think 10, years, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, many people, they thought that it was the next big thing. And that's the end of the nice part. Uh, I'm not going to put slides. I would have slides uh, uh, related to this. Uh, I'm just going to condense uh, my, my point. Uh, um, if you put a research product on ResearchGate, you are not doing open access. You are not going open because ResearchGate is um, um, a commercial initiative. It's not like an institutional, um, um, an archive maintained by an institution. It's not something which is working uh, for uh, the open access movement. So, and, and that's, uh, if you read the two requirements to go open, uh, it explicitly states that uh, going open exclude all the initiatives which has, with, uh, having a commercial flavor. So, uh, ResearchGate, I think it's a useful tool for everyday research, and I think it's uh, an interesting tool for question and answers, even if, uh, if you go out there, there are many other tools, for example, Neurostars, I think many of you are familiar with Neurostar initiative, but it's not a tool to do open access. Sorry about this kind of like passionate answer, but uh, it's like uh, the, the very first page on every open access manual says that ResearchGate or Academia.edu are not tools for going open. Okay, um, there's uh, another question from uh, Christopher Turner. Uh, Christopher writes, I'm interested in your mainstream slash content uh, square. 
from the point of view of interfacing with people outside the scientific community, the general public or policymakers, etc. Do you think Twitter is a good tool for this? And if so, do you think there are any dangers or pitfalls to look out for? So this is a, a very interesting question. By construction, let's say, because everyone could follow you on Twitter. And for example, if for some reason you yourself went mainstream, for example, you were invited to speak to some like uh, local newspaper or TV and so on, you may gain like uh, generic, let's say, followers. Uh, and from that time on, I think uh, you should carefully uh, fine tune the content of your tweets because uh, something could be uh, could be interpreted in a in a bad way and so on. So uh, dangers uh, related to using Twitter and towards the mainstream, I think, uh, are there and. Uh, I think it's very easy to be uh, like to, to, to spread messages which are maybe completely understandable by the rest of your scientific community. Everyone, I think, uh, in scientific community would uh, perfectly understand uh, uh, expressions like uh, something is, is uh, significant, uh, something uh, turned out to be non significant, and so on. But maybe mainstream people uh, they could interpret that result in a, in a different way. And especially for people working with clinical uh, content, uh, let alone uh, here during the pandemic, it's uh, easy uh, to be misinterpreted. Um, I think for policymakers, uh, this might be uh, so you can have like a different kind of content, which is. Uh, somehow targeting policy makers in that uh, uh, you can fine tune uh, specific tweets conveying one specific message which is easy to digest and you may consider it relevant for the for the commun for the global community let's say and in if you have like pretty uh, a pretty good uh, uh, audience in your tweet among your twitter uh, followers uh, I think you, you can also build something on these tweets. So uh, even if uh, in this situation as well, there are dangers and pitfalls, I think the trade-off between the good you can make uh, by using Twitter to reach larger audience, audiences uh, overcome like the, the bad that could be generated. But uh, I would say that I'm not an expert in this kind of like mainstream uh, uh, content so my my answer would be just uh, like in, really two impressions that I have and uh, thoughts that I have uh, just uh, right now I should see and think about this uh, uh, for a few uh, for a few days and then maybe have um, um, uh, have a better answer to you but thanks for the question <laughs>